Tama Sangamaya Tamaso Gamaya Mritya Ma Amritam Gamaya Ave Ave Ma Elhi Rundra Yate Nakshina Mukam Te Namam Bahinityam Om Shanti 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 Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness unto light. Lead us from death to immortality. Reach us through and through, O Lord, and evermore protect us with your sweet and compassionate face. Om peace, peace, peace. Good morning. It's very nice to be back here and see so many happy faces, some new and some very familiar. Uh, the title of today's talk is Batman versus Superman. Um, and uh, when I was a kid, I wanted to be Superman. Um, my mom actually made a little Superman outfit for me when I was probably about three or four years old. She, I don't know how she did it, the usual way, knitting or whatever. Um, and, uh, and so I would run around the neighborhood. I had a red letter S and a cape and the whole thing. And I would uh, put on my Superman outfit and run around the neighborhood and jump and, and save the world, as yeah. only a three or four year old can do, you know, running around what were then vacant lots in Venice. Um, and the fact is that I actually still want to be Superman. <laughs> But my idea of Superman has changed over the years. And um, so the Superman I'm going to talk about today has a small s, not capital S Superman, the guy, right? Small s Superman is the prefix super, literally meaning above man. And so Superman and I'm gonna give a couple examples of this, is uh, above the human condition. That is Superman. That's the Superman as I think of it today. And so I think the best way to illustrate this is with an example. And the example I'm gonna give is from one of Sri Ramakrishna's monastic disciples, Swami Premananda. Swami Premananda, uh, there's a, a lot of incredible stories about this guy. Um, he used to, the founder of this place, another Swami, Swami Prabhavananda, he used to, to take him to a temple in Varanasi, and the streets were very crowded, and he would lead him by the hand. And the Swami said that when he felt the touch of Premananda on his hand, something like an electric current of joy would fill his body. So he had a kind of zap in his hand, but that's not why I think he's Superman. <laughs> um, and uh, another story uh, of him, same place in Varanasi in India. He went into uh, ecstasy in a temple and started to glow, literally glow. So what happened was along this particular strip, which I've walked with Swami Dhyana Yogananda, um, it's about a mile probably from the monastery to the temple and it's crowded like New York subway crowded, maybe more, I mean, shoulder to shoulder. So he's walking back from the temple to the monastery glowing and these crowds of people 
turn and look at him in silent wonder, and everybody just parts. And they all watch this silent, glowing monk walk by. So he's got the zap touch, and he glows in the dark. <laughs> but still, that actually isn't why I think he's Superman. I mean, that's, those are good qualities, of course, I think. Uh, why I think he's Superman is actually from something that I reread recently in the reminiscences of another Swami, Swami Ashokananda. Um, he uh, said this about Swami Premananda when he went to Bangladesh, which was back then called East Bengal. Swami Vivekananda came from this country and he gave one lecture in Bangladesh. And then he came back to the, the monastery there at Bellarmat and he said to Swami Premananda, I have left East Bengal, what they used to call Bangladesh, I have left East Bengal for you. And it turned out to be a prophetic statement because Swami Premananda went there many times. And each time he went, it was an epic event. Swami Ashokananda said that he would go and lecture and meet people and you know shake hands or whatever he did. And then it's far from the monastery to East Bengal or Bangladesh where he lectured. So he would take a horse carriage and on the way back, um, he'd get in his horse carriage to go back and ride off into the sunset. And crowds of people would follow him for miles on foot, sobbing like they had lost a dear relative. This is what Swami Ashokananda said, the effect of his lectures were in East Bangladesh. And so that to me is why he's Superman. And I'd like to go into why I think that's Superman. Um, and the first thing to ask ourselves is, were his lectures that good, right? I mean, okay, there are some really good lecturers out there. I've heard some. Um, we have, probably most of you know the name Swami Sarva Priyananda. He's our YouTube Swami. And he, some of his lectures are millions, millions of people have, have listened to these lectures, right? And he's very good. I listen to them. And I learn something every time. He knows all the scriptures. And he can explain them so that even I can understand them. And uh, yet, with all that, I don't think he's ever had the problem <laughs> of crowds of people following him after the lecture for miles and sobbing. That's something else, right? That sounds like something out of the New Testament, right? Where the, the masses follow Jesus and he did this or that, right? It sounds like that, sort of, right? And so the question is, what's going on there? What is that? It's not just a good lecture. I don't think it was because he was glowing in the dark. And he didn't have time to reach out and zap all these people like he did with the monk there. So there's something else happening. And the best explanation that I found actually came from an American woman uh, who gave a lecture on Swami Vivekananda. I don't know if you can keep track of all these names. Swami Vivekananda in New York. The year was 1955, and she was an old lady at that point. But she had met Swami Vivekananda in New York when she was a young woman. And she described, she was lucky enough to um, have a kind of intimate venue, something probably about half this size. It was a big parlor in a house where Swami Vivekananda spoke. And she made it a point to sit in the front row every single time. Her name was Carolyn Montgomery. Is that right? No, Lillian, sorry, Lillian Montgomery. Has anybody heard, heard that? Not one, okay. Um, I looked on YouTube and there's a few little excerpts of her lecture, but I think it's worth uploading the whole thing. I'm, 
probably going to make that a project. Anyway, uh, it's a powerful lecture. And uh, this is how she describes um, her reaction to his talk. This is Swami Vivekananda now. She said, as he spoke, veil after veil fell from before my eyes. He was like nothing I'd ever seen before. And it all came as such a surprise. I was not at all prepared for Swami Vivekananda. Immediately when he appeared in the room to speak, I knew that there was something extraordinary about him. Presence. You just could not take your eyes off of the man. Power seemed to emanate from him. But there was a calmness and a poise and a natural quality to him at the same time. It seemed like an ocean of consciousness was behind him. And so there seemed to be no limit to his personality. That's an interesting idea, an unlimited personality, an infinite personality. His awareness was not connected to the body and therefore also seemed to be unlimited. It's interesting how she puts that. His awareness was not connected to the body, right? We kind of think that we're these sort of animated mannequins, right? And the awareness is stuck inside the body. You know, the, the eyes open and the lights go on and there it all is out there, right? That's generally how we operate. Uh, but she says he, his awareness was not limited to the body. And if you think about it, that's really what we have. We have an awareness of this body. We're aware of it. The idea that we're inside it is actually something you can't really prove. We could be asleep on an alien spaceship dreaming this dream, right? You couldn't disprove that. It's possible. So his awareness was not limited to this thing. And so it seemed infinite to her. So she was clearly very impressed with him, right? And she's giving this lecture in New York. And, uh, and it's, like I said, it's a powerful presentation she gives, very hushed silence. You can tell in the room there's a kind of charge in the air just from listening to her recall this experience. And so they asked a natural question. Did you meet him? I mean, she went every day, sat in the front row at his feet and watched and had this experience. Did you meet him afterwards? Did you hang around for question and answer afterwards? No, she didn't. Not once. She never asked him a single question. Not only did she not ask him a single question, she couldn't understand why anybody else asked him a single question. She said that here in front of you was this man who was perfection. This was a perfect being, is what she said. By looking at this man, all the problems of my life were solved. It's a remarkable statement. She also said, in seeing Swami Vivekananda, I got all that I wanted. All that I wanted. So the idea, if, if perfection is here in front of you, and it has solved all the problems of your life, and it's explaining to you how you too can also reach this state, which was his recurring theme, that perfection is innate in all of us. And we are all, in fact, destined even whether we like it or not, to reach perfection, ultimately. So she said, here is perfection in front of you telling you how to reach perfection, and you're going to ask it a question? That was her position, right? Clearly, many people did ask him questions. And of course, not everybody has this reaction, right? Clearly, not everybody appreciated Jesus, obviously, or he wouldn't have been crucified, right? Anyway, she went on to describe the situation, and here I'm going to get to why I think this explains the Superman thing. She said, uh, Vivekananda said, blessed are the pure in heart, which I had heard so many times in my life. Quote from the Bible, right? That's Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart. But when he said it, the purity of the man seemed to reflect divinity. Every word he spoke was a revelation. Because while others spoke on faith, he was speaking from a standpoint of something that he was living. His sense of I had expanded to something vast 
deep, pure, and powerful. He perceived the divinity. This is key. This is it. Here's the punchline, okay? He perceived the divinity in every form and perceived it to such a degree that he awakened it in his listeners. That, I think, is the answer. He perceived the divinity to such an extent, with such clarity, so right in front of him, he was aware of the divinity in his listeners, that he awakened that awareness in them as they listened to him speak. This, I think, also explains Swami Premananda. Why would these people follow him? Because he had really helped them. He had really given them a new awareness of their own identity. Maybe you agree with me, maybe you don't, I don't know. But it still doesn't explain one thing. Why cry? Why were they sobbing? They follow Swami Premananda, he's awakened this awareness in them, they're so excited, they've never, they follow him like zombies. Why sob, right? Why would you sob? Well, when so many people are sobbing, it's difficult to say, oh, they all did it because of this or that, right? I mean, they probably each one might have had some different reaction, right? People are different. My feeling, based on my own much more limited experience, is that um, when you have a, a, even just a tiny little glimpse of an elevated consciousness, when your mind rises and you feel the joy, uh, the relief, the sense of well-being, you're finally home, everything's okay, there's a kind of security and, and at the same time excitement, as paradoxical as that may seem, you feel all these things, and then you realize that this isn't going to last. <laughs> you are going to come back down and be your old self again after this, and you are going to have to work your way back up to whatever this is. Now, however it happened, maybe you got to meet one of these supermen, maybe it was just a moment of grace, maybe you've been struggling in the shrine, you got lucky that day, uh, whatever it is, right? Whatever it is, that brings us that sense of exaltation. When we really have enough of it and we go, oh, that's it. At the same time, there's a kind of, this, uh, th this isn't going to last and I'm going to have to work to get this back. That work to get this back bit, pretty intimidating. That's how I explain the tears, okay? I might be wrong, this is, I'm just guessing here, right? But this is how I explain the tears, because this guy who can do it by looking at you and talking to you is getting into his horse carriage and riding off into the sunset, and you wait, 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 wait. More, 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 right? Where are you going, right? So that's what I mean when I say he's really helped, but in opening the eyes of the people that he spoke to, they know what's in front of them. And they may, right or wrong, they think it's intimidating and a long road, which most of the time it is. Most, I mean, some people win the lottery, most of the time it's a long and intimidating road to get to this level of consciousness. So, now the next question is, why do I wanna be Superman? Do I want you all to follow me out of this room sobbing? Is that what I'm here for? No, who wants that? I don't want that. Uh, like I said, he helped them. He helped them, and I think that this is actually why we all, one reason, I'm gonna give another one, this is one reason why I think we all want to be Superman. Because we've all had some time or other in our lives, perhaps multiple times, when we really wanted to help. We genuinely loved someone who was hurting, maybe they had a physical problem, 
an emotional problem, a spiritual problem, and we felt like there was nothing we could do. I don't think, if you haven't had that experience yet, I think you will before you get off of this rock. I, I don't think anybody gets to avoid that one. Um, and so that ability to really help, and yes, there are plenty of examples of these super souls that didn't just, I mean, they actually help physical problems. There's, of course, mood elevation. Someone's depressed and you're with one of these guys, it's over. But, you know, if you're on life support in a hospital and you're sitting next to your loved one and you think, well, what good would it do if I was a saint now? It would. They may not jump out of bed, but it would definitely, it would benefit everyone. It benefits the person in bed. It benefits the nurses and the doctors and you, everybody else. This is real help. This is real help. To demonstrate through your own conviction to other people what they are. Right? So that's one reason why I want to be Superman. And of course, for now, we still have to try and help. We're not Superman yet, but we have no choice. Even though we feel like, oh, there's nothing I can do, or I don't know what to do. Well, you've got some idea. It may be right or wrong, but you've got some idea of how to help, and you have to pursue it, even though you don't really know that it's going to be help. And this is true in every situation, even the most obvious situation we face. Building on fire, child, baby, save it, right? Seems clear. Go save the kid. That's the right thing to do, right? But you don't really know, right? You save the kid. The kid grows up, becomes a serial killer. How could you possibly know that? You couldn't know it, right? So you have to do the right thing. What you think is the right thing at the time. You can't just let the analysis of all the possibilities paralyze you, right? We can't do that. We have to act, but we have to offer these acts, right? This is karma yoga. For those of you, I think everybody knows that by now. This is karma yoga, where we don't really know, but we say, okay, Lord, this is what seems like I'm supposed to do here, and so I'm going to offer this to you, and you know, only you really know, but you know where my heart is. My heart is coming from a position of love, right? Love and a, and a genuine altruistic desire to help this person that I love, or maybe that I don't even know. But the motivation is love, right? The motivation for help is love. With Superman, not with Batman. Okay, Batman also thinks he's trying to help. Batman is not motivated by, by love, okay? Now Batman, unlike Superman as a small ass, Batman has a big B. Okay, this is the guy, Batman, that I'm gonna talk about. So Batman, um, who is he? Probably everybody knows. He's been TV, movies, comic books. Uh, as he's an ultra rich kid, beyond spoiled, more money than you could shake a stick at. Um, and uh, his parents were shot in front of him when he was a kid, an impressionable kid. And um, he decided to devote the rest of his life to avenging their death. He's going to be a vigilante. He's going to go out and, and take care of bad guys, put them in jail, kill them, whatever it takes. So Batman also thinks he's trying to help, right? What is Batman's motivation? Batman's motivation is revenge, not love, right? Why is Batman seeking revenge? Because he's attached. He can't give up his own anger. He can't let go of the pain that he feels. And what does he do about it? Something he's not entitled to do, right? He's not a cop, and he won't belittle himself to go join the police academy, right? That's beneath him because he's super wealthy. So he's completely egotistical. Now, I realize there may be some Batman fans out there. I'm going to throw him under the bus, all right? <laughs> uh, Batman is completely egotistical, entitled, acting out of vengeance and an inability to let go of his own anger. But he cloaks it in a veil of altruism, right? He says, that's not really my motivation. I just want to save other little rich kids from getting their parents offed by poor muggers, right? Not fair to put the class uh, references in there. 
He wouldn't say that. He would say, I want to save other kids from getting their parents killed by bad guys, right? So I'm actually being unselfish in my actions. This is Batman's explanation of his own behavior, right? Well, he's, of course, completely ignorant, right? Batman has been rich his whole life, and he's lovingly raised by a butler after his parents die, right? So he has no idea the people he's decided that he's qualified to put in jail, which he isn't, because he's got a lot of money and a lot of toys, and he's just going to go do this stuff, right? He has no concept of their lives, no sympathy for them at all, and no understanding of what they've gone through, how basically a, a maybe a good person through poverty might be induced to do things that they wouldn't otherwise. Batman can't relate to that because he's got more money than he knows what to do with. I mean, he could take that same money and start a college fund, right? He could take the same money and start soup kitchens. He's not going to do any of that. He's going to buy a bunch of fancy toys and a car and a cave and, and put these guys in jail or shoot them or whatever, right? So I think you can probably see where I'm going with this. <laughs> maybe, I don't know, maybe you can't. But um, we all have an inner Batman. We all have a Batman in here and in here. We've got our own Batman. We all do. A voice and a motivation inside of us that tries to convince us that it is being unselfish and altruistic and in fact has cloaked its unselfishness or its, its selfishness in this bat cape or whatever, right? So it hides its motives from us, right? And if we are going to grow as spiritual beings, our inner Superman is going to have to overcome and ultimately kill our inner Batman. The movie came out a while ago, and it seemed to me absurd because I didn't think Batman had a chance. But, you know, I was here um, at the time, I think right around the time the movie came out, and it, there are actually people that lined up on both sides of the issue. Some people thought Batman would win this fight. There's a movie. I don't know if you remember. It was like 2016, I think. Anyway, um, we have to kill Batman. That's our job. Okay, so that's the first reason that I want to be Superman. The first reason I want to be Superman is to help out of love, right? That's how Superman acts. He acts out of love. And I feel that this is a universal motivation that we all have. What's the second reason I want to be Superman? Again, back to the root of the prefix, above. Superman is above this world. What does that mean? It means he is above the push and pull of this world. This is another universal problem we all have, right? There are things that I want to do and things that I want to avoid doing. There are people that I want to be with and people that I want to avoid being with. There are foods that I want to eat and foods that I want to avoid eating. Down the list, the whole human experience, stuff I like, stuff I don't like, right? We run towards the stuff that we like. We run away from the stuff that we don't like. You say, well, that doesn't sound so bad. Yeah, okay, that's life. So what? Well, let's think about it for a second. Some of these things that we, don't, that we like, that we run after, we don't want to like. We call that temptation, right? It's pulling on you, and you want it, but you, there's part of you that says, no, no, I've done that one before. Don't need to go down that road again, right? But then what do we do? If we really want it, all those voices of clarity and reason and conscience, we just push those out of the way and grab it, right? And then after it's over and we have it, whatever it is, could be a person, could be an activity, we all have our own poison. After it's over, what happens? We're done, it's over, and all those voices of self-condemnation and I told you so in your conscience and maybe even self-hatred come in and torment us, right? And we do this again and again. At least I have. <laughs> I you probably have too. Sri Ramakrishna uh, gives the example of a camel. He says, uh, the camel loves to eat thorny bushes. The more it eats the thorns, the more the blood gushes from its mouth. Still, it must eat thorny plants and will never give them up. The man of worldly nature suffers so much sorrow and affliction, but he forgets it all in a few days and goes back to his old life. 
This is the human condition, right? Superman is above this. Another one of these pushes and pulls, that's just one problem. That's temptation, right? There's also attachments where you want it, you want it, you want it, and then you got it, whatever it is, a person, a thing, bank accounts, whatever. You've got it, but then other people want it. They want to take it from you. And so now we've got to calculate about how we're going to keep it. And maybe it's a person and we have to make this person, we want this person to stay with us and they want to want to stay with us and all these calculations we go through, right? And we find ourselves calculating about our self-interest a lot. <laughs> so much so that it can get tiring. And of course, it's perhaps needless to say that some people never tire of this, never tire of calculating their own self-interest. But the fact is, it is exhausting. Our minds could be dwelling on so many more worthwhile activities than this petty little self-interest. But it plagues us. And of course, Batman's whole life is a reaction to, a, to an event. Pursuing his self-interest, which means trying to rid himself of the pain of his loss. Right? That's what he's trying to do. Rid himself of the pain of the loss of his parents. By doing what? By inflicting pain and loss on other people. Never going to work. Right? Can't be reactionary. We have to, at some point, realize how much time we spend calculating our own self-interest. And now, just like I gave another uh, Superman example, I'm going to give an example of this kind of Superman. And this is not the Swami of the Ramakrishna order. This is a Zen master named Hakuin Akaku, who lived in the late 1600s, early 1700s. I first uh, heard about this guy when I read Eckhart Tolle's book. Um, I can't remember which book it was. I th does anybody know who I'm talking about? Zen Master Hakuin Akaku? Some people do. Zen Master Hakuin Akaku, uh, I think it was A New Earth, Eckhart Tolle. I think it's in that book. And I looked it up, and there's more on him on the internet, of course. Um, anyway, so what's his story? Um, he started, Zen, born in a little village in Japan, Hara, it's called, uh, started off with Zen very young, had some spiritual experiences, achieved enlightenment at 41. By the time he died, his village in Hara became this Zen center of learning. It was, it was transformed from an ordinary Japanese backwater to a Zen center because of the influence of his life, right? You had a great Zen master there that just attracted this stuff. And so how is he Superman? How is this a fascinating story? Uh, he's got his ashram and his followers, um, you know, and he's running a Zen center and all that stuff. A local teenage girl gets knocked up by some yokel. She's pregnant. And um, her parents find out. They're furious. And they say to the girl, who did this? And the girl doesn't want to turn in her sweetheart. So what she does is she points at the Zen master, says, it's Hakuin. He's the father of, of this child. Of course, the parents are infuriated at this. And they run off to the Zen center. And, you know, hey, as our daughter told us, it was you and you made her pregnant and blah, blah, blah. And they spread, you know, Hakuin's a fake and all this. He loses everything. What does Hakuin say to the parents? So. Yeah. You read it. He says, is that so? That's it. Is that so? He doesn't defend himself. OK, so then everybody, they believe the parents. They believe the teenage girl. They leave Hawkwind. The whole place is deserted. He's homeless. Never utters a word of protest. Nine months later, she gives birth. The parents angrily, furiously bring this kid. This is your son or daughter, whatever it was. I don't know. Uh, you have to take care of it. Is that so? That's the response. Is that so? And uh, so what does he do? He walks door to door begging for the child. Totally humiliated and ruined he is. 
from big shot Zen master to homeless beggar with a kid in his arms, door to door, trying to feed this thing. It goes on for a year. Finally, the pregnant, formerly pregnant teenage daughter uh, can't take the guilt. It's just too much for her. And so she tells her parents it's this yokel at the butcher shop, wasn't, wasn't the Zen master. And uh, so the parents, oh, mortified, right? And they go to Hawkwind. Oh, how could we? We're so sorry, blah, 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 blah. Is that so? That's the answer. Is that so? Totally above all of it, completely above the attachment. You know, now I've got a Zen center. I've made it. I mean, okay, he's not got a lot of money, but he's got a lot of admiration, right? Um, he's got a reputation. For some people, that's much more important than money. They say, actually, that's the last one to go, this desire for people's recognition and fame, right? That that's the last and final attachment after you get over money and lust and all these other things. Meant nothing to him. Is that so? And then it all comes back. Doesn't mean anything. Is that so? Right? So I would say he's Superman because he is above this push and pull. And I would also say, maybe odd for a Japanese Zen master, he's a real Christian. Why? Because what does Jesus say? Um, Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. But I say to you that you resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn him the other also. Right? Matthew. Um, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, that is, according to Vedanta, a real Christian. Not what you believe. Here is after you go, then you go to some of the clouds or whatever that is. Or you have to believe that Jesus did this or that. No. That's it. Where you resist not evil. You are transformed into someone who can resist not evil. Think of the power of the man who can do something like that. He's not human. Which one of us could do this? I would also say that he's a real Hindu. He's a real Hindu because Krishna, what does Krishna say? I forgot Krishna's thing. Krishna says, okay, I don't see it here, but he says he is lucky and does not rejoice. He is unlucky and does not grieve. I call him a lumen. That's the Bhagavad Gita, right? He is lucky and does not rejoice. He is unlucky and does not grieve. I call him illumined. Right, so he's a real Hindu. And in fact, according to Vedanta, he's a real everything. Because that's really religion. That's real religion, according to Vedanta. Right? Swamiji describes uh, what real religion is. He says, religion is being and becoming, not hearing and acknowledging. That's religion. Being and becoming, not hearing and acknowledging. And this man has become something. Zen Master Hawkwind has become something. He's not just acknowledging a teaching, right? He says, it is not an intellectual ascent, but one's whole nature becoming changed into it. See, fighting over dogma is kid stuff, right? Fighting over what you believe and I believe and these things, that's, that's child, that's the shallow end of the pool we're kicking around in with religion, right? That's not it. Religion is becoming something better, becoming Superman. That's religion. And so I've heard people say um, over the years that this sounds boring, especially Krishna's verse in the Gita, where he says, uh, I call him, he, he is lucky and does not rejoice. He is unlucky and does not grieve. I call him illumined, right? Krishna says that in the Gita. And people say, yeah, well, that sounds boring. That's not life, right? If I win the lottery, naturally I'm going to celebrate. To just go, is that so, like a zombie, <laughs> right? What kind of life is that? Right, people, I've heard this objection, right? What kind of life is it if, if you, all these things happen and you're just a nerd, right? Is that so, is that so, is that so? Um, no, <laughs> it's not inertia, right? That's not why the Zen master is saying, is that so, is that so, is that so? 
He's aware of what's going on. He knows that he's lost his ashram. He's not, he's not an idiot. He's not a zombie, right? He knows all these things. Why don't they affect him? Because he's practicing something really hard. You know, I heard that I have to be really good. And, you know, you can't fake it like that. Because you read that in a book and then it happens to you and oh, you have some reaction. You don't just go, oh, is that so? You're not living in detachment like he is. He's living in a kind of detachment that some people think is bland and boring. Right? It isn't. I'm saying it isn't. Why isn't it? Because he has something so good inside of himself that he has found that he knows he cannot lose that is better than anything out here. He knows that there's nothing out here, Zen sensor or whatever else, that can compare to what he's already found within his own consciousness. That is why he can just look at these people and say, is that so? Because he is living in a kind of bliss that is so far above the losses and gains of this world, right? When you have millions and millions of dollars, nickels don't amount to much, which is basically winning the lottery. That's why you say, is that so? It just doesn't matter anymore because you've got something that much better. Maybe hard to believe. I don't know, is that hard to believe that, that I mean, Religion can actually be so good, <laughs> but it has to be. Otherwise, how do you explain these people? Uh, Shankara, um, the author of The Crest Jewel of Discrimination, famous, uh, I think he was 8th century saint in South India. Um, he tried to describe the moments of illumination, what it's like, right? Um, and this kind of explains maybe where Hawkwind might have been mentally, uh, which allowed him to withstand what would be for anyone else ruin. Uh, so this is Shankara. He says, oh, my master, where has this world gone which I saw just now a few minutes back? What a wonder. What is there which is separate and different from Brahman? The great ocean of Brahman being filled up by the nectar of infinite bliss. What is there to be accepted and what is there to be abandoned? It's all good, right? If I have it all, win the lottery, lose it all, it's all good. I am so full of the bliss of self that I do not need anything else. That's what it says in um, Narada Bhakti Sutras. It says, um, we become satisfied forever. Satisfied forever. No other venture in life makes dares to make that promise. You know, your, your all-time <coughs> ultimate dream girl or boy or non-binary, whatever the alternatives are. Uh, your dream person, your dream job, your dream house, your dream, none of them will, pro and you would be a fool to think that if I just get this, I'll be satisfied forever. And yet we kind of operate that way. I mean, we know better, and yet we go after it a lot of the time as if we would be satisfied forever. But no one would dare to make that promise, get this job and you'll be satisfied forever. You know, marry me and you'll be satisfied. Well, maybe they would say that. I don't know. Uh, but you'd be a fool to believe it, right? And yet religion says this. Realize this goal and you'll be satisfied forever. Christ calls it the peace that passeth all understanding. And the Gita says that the heart is so full, it hardly holds its love. Right? So imagine that. The fullness of your heart in all situations, at all times, you can hardly hold it. You are so full of love and joy and bliss. Does it matter where you live? If you have that love and bliss and joy filling your heart, once we have that, there's nothing in this world that can compare to it. And even if we get a glimpse of it, we know Nothing out here is going to be that. 
For better or worse, we know that. And like those crying people who followed Swami Premananda, in my opinion, I might be wrong, thought, oh no, I'm going to have to work for this because this guy's going off into the sunset. The Bhagavad Gita says we will all realize this eventually. We will all find this eventually. It says once you've asked the way to the path of union with Brahman, you will be dragged onward towards the goal even in spite of yourself. For better or worse, I know that that's true because I have in my life thought to heck with this religion business. It was a long time ago, but I have. You can't really give it up. You can't. What you do, if you're really, if, if you're after this and you get frustrated and you try and give it up, you, you know, just quit your practice or whatever it is, you will find yourself dragged back towards this path and you will find it very painful to get here. If you want to save yourself the pain, just go along with the program. <laughs> Just do your practice. Just stay on the path. If you decide I've had it with this and I'm going to quit and I'm going to do something else, well, the beatings will continue until morale improves. That's been my experience anyway. So I guess uh, I should talk a little bit about how to become Superman, assuming I've sold you on the product. Um, so how to become Superman? I said we have to kill Batman. How hard is that? Well, um, it turns out Batman's pretty hard to kill, actually. Like I said, I thought Superman was going to mop the floor with him in the movie, and um, it turned out to be a little bit better fight than I thought. One of the big problems with killing Batman is finding him. <laughs> because he hides. Like I said, in this kind of cloak of altruism he puts on, where he's not really being selfish, he's not really being resentful, this is just what's right, right? So Batman doesn't want to be found. I guess I'm found by this bug. Come on, buddy, get out of here. Um, and so how do we find Batman? We have to, we have to look. We have to examine ourselves. We have to examine our motives. Why am I doing this really, right? Do we, how often do we think that, right? The inner voice says, go out and fight crime. Well, why do I really want to go out and fight crime, Batman, right? Um, but we don't, we're not in that habit. We're not in that habit of self-examination, right? It's not natural to us. What's natural to us is to look out there and see that's the problem. Go get it or run from it, whatever it is, right? Kill it or run away from it. That's the natural response that we have. We see life around us and the problem is here, it's there, it's this person, it's this job, it's this city, it's this habit, whatever it is, right? It's out there somewhere, right? So we have to examine ourselves and find what our share of this is, the self-examination process. But it is not natural to us. Uh, Swami Vivekananda says, he puts it this way, he says, there's one great danger in human nature, and that is that man never examines himself. He thinks he is quite as fit to be on the throne as the king. Now there's a pretty apt little illustration he gives, right? We form a few political opinions, and we know what the president should be doing, and we know who should be president. Some people feel so strongly about this that last year in January, they actually attacked you know, flying across the country, attacked Congress because they were so sure that they knew who should be president. Right? They're so, their opinions are so strong, they're going to follow them all the way across the country and do this crazy thing. Right? Just because we have a few political opinions doesn't make us fit to be president. Just because Batman doesn't like crime doesn't make him fit to fight it. Especially since he's too egotistical to go try out for the Police academy, right? I'm too rich and privileged for that. I'm not going to debase myself for that. I know what they should be doing better than they do. Never mind, I've never studied any of their methods, or maybe he has, but he's going to do it his way, right? So same thing, right? These opinions, these strong opinions. The first thing about examining ourselves 
to try and recognize is that maybe not all of my strong opinions are perfectly 100% right. You know, we have some opinions that we're not so sure about. We're willing to negotiate on those. Then we've got some other opinions that we are pretty certain about those opinions, right? And other people have really strong opinions about something we think is ridiculous, right? Like this guy thinks he's so sure about who should be president. He's going to go to Washington, D.C. and do this insane thing. A lot of most people, I would say, think that's silly. But we all have something, some strong opinion that we are just, it's black and white, right? We're done examining that one. No more input there. We're finished with that and we move on to something else. We just operate on that opinion, right? Examine, right? We have to examine ourselves, okay? And Swamiji says, even if he is, he must first show, even if he is fit to be the king, right? So even if we're right about our political opinion, even if he is, he must first show that he has done the duty of his own position and then higher duties will come to him, right? So before you go to Washington and attack the buildings, be a good father, be a good mother, be a good brother, sister, be a good person, be a good employee, right? Be a good dog owner, whatever it is, right? Be good at it. Your station in life, whatever it has been given to you, perform that well. Be a good person. Fulfill that. Once that's fulfilled, other things will come to you naturally. This is what he's saying. And I think many of us in this room have probably lived long enough to see this happen in our own lives. When you're really finished with something, something else comes. And there's a kind of natural and graceful way that this can happen, or there's an abrupt and, and violent way that this can happen, right? <clears throat> but see, Vivekananda's solution is humbling. Just go home, be a good person, go to work, be nice to your boss, all these things. Batman's like, no way, I'm putting on a cape and I'm going to go fight crime, right? I'm not going to just be some humble guy who does what he's told. But see, being the good person, what does it mean? It means acting like Superman. It means bringing more love into your surroundings, right? That's what it means. Bringing more love to the people, not just the people we love, but the people we like and the people we don't like, especially them. Superman can do that, which is a real trick, right? to love the people we don't like. So that's Vivekananda's solution. And um, the nice thing about this is, is that he says that we will all eventually become Superman. In fact, he makes a kind of prediction about this world that's a little millennial in its seeming thinking, um, where, and this isn't just him, actually. A lot of spiritual teachers, if you go on... YouTube or whatever, you listen to these people, they have a kind of new agey thinking where there's a groundswell of spiritual consciousness happening now. I don't know if any of you have noticed this. If you, if you surf through spiritual talks on YouTube and, and you read some you know, pop spiritual books, you find this thought is not that uncommon. But um, Swamiji also says this. He doesn't call them supermen. He calls them prophets. But he's going to explain what prophets are in this thing I'm going to read and we're going to see that they are, in fact, supermen. He says, The time is to come when prophets will walk through every street in every city in the world. That's a lot of supermen. Every street in every city in the world. The time is coming. Swami Vivekananda says this. The time is coming when we shall understand that to become religious means to become a prophet. Right? That's what we've been talking about this whole time. It doesn't mean assenting to a set of doctrines. It means transformation. That's what religion is, right? And at some point, he says, everybody's going to get this. <clears throat> we will understand that no one can become religious until he or she becomes a prophet. We shall come to understand that the secret of religion is not being able to think and say all these ideas, but to realize them, to discover them, to bring them to society, to be supermen. He says, we must see religion, feel it, realize it in a thousand times more intense a sense than I see this wall. See, that's, we're back to the beginning now, right? Because that's what Lillian Montgomery said that Swami Vivekananda did in your presence that was so transformational. He saw the divine in you, in the people that were listening to such a degree, so intently, just like he says here, he saw the divinity and the people that were listening to him so intently, with such certainty and clarity, that he awakened to that awareness in them. 
right? That's what he says the prophet is. That's what I've been calling Superman for the last hour. And he says that one day, amazingly, this world, this very place where everybody says, yes, everything's all so terrible all the time. I hear this all the time. Oh, it's like the world's going to a pot, you know. This very place is going to become filled with supermen. That is what Swami Vivekananda says. May we all become that. May the good Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. <clears throat> May good be tied all. May happiness come to all. May all see the face of truth and be fortified with the armor of love, goodwill, joy, and understanding. Om peace, peace, peace. we think alike. I was all for Superman, even though I was pretty static. Eh? That's what I'm afraid of. Um, anybody who would like to pass some comments or questions? That was a beautiful analogy. Thank you for that. Yes. Uh, I had a little comment. You know, you're talking about Superman and Batman. And I was uh, reminded of the Sufi philosophy uh, they talk about jihad in, in the Islamic world, where you go out and fight the kafirs and win the world so that the, the non-believers become believers. That's your tradition, jihad. But the Sufi way of looking at the same jihad is a whole different way. Mm. It's saying the battle is not without, it's within. You battle against your own nafs. Nafs is the ego that we have. And it's a huge battle in itself. And what is the point of this outside battle? So I, I found an analogy to that with the way the the way Superman operates and the way Batman operates. Also with the Gita, right? Same with the Gita. Sorry, sorry. I'm recording you with the camera. And it's I out. have to stay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, same with the Gita, right? Because um, it's, a, it's a war, right? The whole Gita is told on a battlefield, right? But that's a metaphor, right? You've got the Pandava brothers, five of them, and the Kuravas, a hundred. The Pandava brothers are your five good tendencies. And the Kuravas are your hundred evil tendencies. And the Lord is your charioteer, and he says, go out and fight them. And you say, no, they're my friends. Right? They're my friends. I've known them for so long. There's my uncle and there's my aunts and there's whatever else. Well, I don't think the aunt was there. But anyway, uh, I've known them. They're my friends, my relatives. Right? Because we have habits. We have evil habits. And we think they're good. We think Batman is Superman. Right? But uh, the fact is, no. Krishna says, look again. Those hundred... You know, relatives that you think are your friends, they are not. Those are the evil tendencies, the Batman's tendencies that you have to overcome. The whole Gita is a metaphor. That war is a metaphor for the internal struggle that I'm calling Batman versus Superman today. So, yeah, same, same idea. Yeah. Uh, Orel. Orel. I knew that. <laughs> what is the most precious thing? What is? The most precious thing. <clears throat> The most precious thing, thing. What is the thing? What, what do you mean? What is most precious? What is if most you precious? Know the word thing. What is the most precious? Hmm. Um. <clears throat> well, I would say that love conquers all. What is the most precious? Love conquers everything. 
Every situation, I don't think there's any situation that you bring real love to that isn't conquered. It's conquered, right? Love conquers. If you can really love, think about someone who says something harsh to you, right? And if you can actually respond in the moment in love, they're toast. They can't stand up to that. All their anger is gone. All their agenda with you is over. I think love is the most precious thing. I think love is the great dream. <clears throat> love is what we all want. You know, we work for money and stuff and this or that thing may be precious. <clears throat> but the reason we think that is because we think it's going to bring more love into our life. The reason we do everything we do is for love. Um, you know, we think we work for money. Right? And then we're not happy at our job. Why not? They're giving us the money because we don't get love there. Right? That's the problem with our job and with our boss. Right? He pays me like he said he would. But I'm not feeling any love, and so I don't like him. Well, he didn't like you either, because he's not feeling any love from you, right? <laughs> Same problem. When have you ever done anything just to be nice to your, you know, my boss really likes this or that. I mean, you can be a sycophant and try and get yourself promoted that way, but to genuinely, you know, people see right through that stuff. To actually be genuinely gracious and magnanimous and loving, you'll change your whole work environment, right? So yes, I think love is the most precious thing, if it's a thing. Uh, it's a delete the word thing. What is the most precious? My opinion, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi. Hello. Uh, thank you. Nice talk. Uh, um, I think you're too harsh on that. Yeah, I thought I, there's a more like you, I think. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, my question is. So you brought up a point that's really kind of been plaguing me. It's something that I've been thinking about quite a lot. Um, so where does omniscient of truth become beneficial? Like, okay, so real quick, my roommate so stoked to make uh, this stroganoff, right? She made it. Uh, you know, she talked about it for months. Salty, nasty, it was horrible, right? <laughs> so she asked me what I think about it, and I, you know, I was taught if you don't have something nice to say, you don't say anything at all. But how am I benefiting her? And then I thought about that with the Zen master when he told that story. Like, how is he benefiting that child or the parents or the community in general by not just saying, you know, okay, you know, I'll accept that this is what this woman is saying. It's not true, but I will accept it. Like, where is that line, Troy? I mean, it feels like there's kind of got to be a balance there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what my question is. Where is that? Okay, well, to, to get to the what the Zen master did for us, I think I tried to explain <clears throat> that today. And that is he showed us the ideal. He showed us a very, very high ideal. Okay, that is the ideal, to be completely non-resistant of evil. Now, what does Krishna say to Arjuna in the Gita? Arjuna basically gives a speech very much like Jesus to Krishna. He basically says kind of a Sermon on the Mount type speech to Krishna, he gives, right? What does Krishna say? Wow, Arjuna, you're so not resisting evil. You're such a uh, wonderful person. No, he says you're a coward. Go fight, right? Why? Because he's not there yet. He's just parroting things that he's heard. He actually, like I said, we've got the 100 Kuravas that are the evil tendencies in our mind that we think are our friends, right? We're going to have to fight them. After we have conquered it all, completely mastered ourselves, like Hawkwind had done, then we do not have to resist evil. It's all good because we are so full of love. We don't even see evil. As Shankara said in his realization, it is an ocean of Brahman, right? It is all Bliss, inside, outside. That's it, right? But we're not there yet. And like I said in the beginning, Superman acts out of love. We don't have it, but we try. We see what we think we have to do in a particular situation, whatever that is. And I don't know what to say if somebody made stroganoff that's no good. Uh, you know, something nice that isn't yet, I don't know. I know one story of a woman that, that she saw, another woman that she had known, was just wearing the ugliest outfit she'd ever seen in her life. And, and um, the woman said, look at my new outfit. 
what do you think? You know? She said, you know, it's a really nice feather on your hat. Right? There, there, there is, now if you can see it in a moment, that's a talent, but there is a redeeming quality in every situation. Granted, it's not that easy to see all the time, right? Um, nevertheless, the, the over, you know, I don't know how to deftly get out of a lousy dinner, um, but uh, the, the situation that Hawkwind presented was the perfect ideal, on the way to the perfect ideal, right? We have to try and recognize our own tendencies, good and bad, selfish and unselfish. And when we do those, we have to fight the, the selfish tendencies, right? So that path of perfect nonviolence towards evil is not preliminary. That is after, that is Superman, who has conquered it all through love, right? There is no evil in his life. That's where he is. No, okay. I saw him before, so please go ahead. Uh, I'm new to this uh, center here, uh, only my second time. Uh, the one of the reasons I came, maybe main reason actually, is uh, somebody told me that you uh, had studied uh, physics in the past, and in fact, you have a PhD in physics. Is that? Uh, okay, I'm feeling like I'm on the spot here, but yes. <laughs> well, uh, the reason that I raised that is because. Uh, as you know, you know, you have a PhD, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so you <laughs> that's so. Uh, is that so? Right, very good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that, uh, and I mean, there is a lot of knowledge that is coming, you know, about the material world through that particular study, and that there are strong connections between, you know, what is being studied in that mode, that discipline, uh, as compared to what we experience in spiritual work or spiritual activity. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, is that something that uh, you still even think about or, or get involved, or is that something you've just left so far behind this position? That's why I started studying it. It's because I was fascinated by those connections. Um, and then um, after it took me years to figure out that making these intellectual connections wasn't really making me any more spiritual. I mean, it might have helped. But the idea that I can see a similarity in whatever, quantum field theory and the ocean of Brahman, right? Let's say I can make some intellectual mapping between those two things for the sake of arguments. It doesn't help me resist temptation in the moment of trial. It doesn't... You know, that is the intellectual ascent. That's what Swami Vivekananda said. It's an intellectual ascent. Yeah, cool. Modern physics. Ocean of Brahman, right? Intellectual. Fun. Does it transform you? Maybe it does some. It wasn't transforming me, at least not enough. And so that idea that religion is being and becoming was not fulfilled through the study of physics for me and my feeling is that the study of anything isn't really going to do that. Religion has to be practiced as religion, and it's got its own method. Physics has a method. Religion has a method. And you have to undertake the practices of religion to make advances in religion, to, as St. Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your own mind, right? You have to renew your mind. Studying something isn't going to do that. It's something else. It's a different kind of practice. Okay, so yes, and it took me a long time to realize this. And now, you know, occasionally I'll read some physics thing, but it's, it doesn't have that allure for me like it did. Yeah. Uh, for us devotees that we are not there and waiting for the world with prophets in every street of every city, when we hear these sad news, when we hear war for Ukraine or what is happening to Iranians, what do you suggest as a devotee that are filled with peace and love to do because we're humans and we cannot just close our eyes? 
to feel like that we contributed to help these voiceless people on the other side of the wall and uh, feel not guilty of living in a better world without all of these violence, the freedom that we have here. And feel like that, okay, what can I do? Witnessing all of this, I cannot close my eyes and be indifferent. What do you suggest? Yeah, so, you know, obviously Iran and Ukraine are very far away. Um, and so I don't know, maybe you have some connections. Maybe there's something you can do that's material that presents itself to you. It's possible. I don't know. Uh, I live out in the Mojave Desert. Um, there's not a whole lot materially that I can do. But um, what Swami Vivekananda says, which I practice, and I recommend that all of you practice this, uh, before you start your daily devotions, however many times a day you do them, um, just for five minutes, you try and imagine your own heart chakra full of love. First start there. Right? Imagine your own heart chakra full of love. And then imagine that love filling your body all the way from your toes, fingertips, top of your head. You can try this. Try this with me, okay? Imagine the love in your heart expanding to fill your whole body. Imagine that this love is a kind of living light. And this living light is shining through our bodies. Our bodies are actually transparent. And the light of love shines through our bodies. And we send this light of love, loving thoughts, thoughts of healing, thoughts of comfort, strength, and joy. We send these thoughts to the north, we send these thoughts to the south. We send this loving, healing light to the east and to the west and above and below. Light, living, loving light, filling our bodies, filling the space around us filling all the beings with that same joy, comfort, strength, love. And then we pull that light back into ourselves, back into our heart chakra. And then we begin our prayers. Then we begin our daily devotion, okay? What did that take? Five minutes? Four? Not five. It was less than five minutes, right? Try it. Okay? May not seem like much, but if you haven't been given the means materially to do anything for people 10,000 miles away, this will make you feel better. And you say, okay, well, that's you know, you're just hypnotizing yourself into thinking that you're helping. No, it's not true. It's not true. Because if you do this regularly, you find that you bring this more often into your own life. And when you do that, the people that you interact with, they are going to change also. It takes a while to see it, but it does happen. So it's not just living in some dream world. It's more to it than that. Okay, you are affecting your environment. You know, someday maybe when we're Superman, we can affect the environment 10,000 miles away. I don't know. But for now, practicing that, bringing more love into our immediate surroundings, and you will no longer be bothered by these thoughts of what can I do for the people in Ukraine and Iran. They will stop tormenting you, these thoughts. So that is 
that was transforming. It was really good. Um, the Trump or Batman versus Superman was also enlightening, but um, I always try to look for applicability in my life. We all have, but obviously nowhere close to, you know, having, being in close to it. So I'm a little confused. I don't know where I read it in uh, maybe a complete works or um, Krishna, but like, the snake shouldn't bite, but he should hiss. And how do you reconcile that with, is that so, or like in practical life, offering your left cheek or being slapped on the right? So how do you say hissing? How, how can I say yeah, it's a great question. And, and I think the parable is, is beautiful, right? Because uh, it's the answer to your question, too. Um, and that is, uh, you know, as long as we perceive evil, right? We're living in this basically ordinary perception. This, this is good, that's bad, that kind of thing, right? Then in order to protect Right? This body is our vehicle for spiritual life. This is the vehicle through which we are going to grow spiritually, right? A kind of spacesuit we're wearing for 70 or 80 years until we run, it runs out of gas, right? <clears throat> and so in order to protect it so that we can continue to grow along spiritual lines, we have to frighten evil away from us. That's the idea, right? You must make a show of anger, is the parable, uh, in order to protect yourself, right? This is the householder's duty. The problem is, uh, you know, Jesus gives this teaching in, in, the, in the gospel, um, uh, blessed, um, you have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you that ye resist not evil, right? But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also, right? So who is he speaking to? A little known fact, you look at, at the book of Matthew, he called the 12 disciples away from the masses and gave them that lecture. They were monks. He didn't give that lecture to the householders. What's the householder lecture? The householder lecture is in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says to Arjuna, fights, right? So on the road to this lofty state above good and evil, right, we've got to fight. Now, we don't want to be vindictive. We don't want to necessarily harm. But at the same time, this is the world. And from time to time, we're going to have to hiss. Now, you know, this is another time where Batman gets pretty confusing because he'll tell you, oh, I was just hissing, right? <laughs> right, that wasn't, I didn't really bite, right? So you have to be careful. The self-examination process seems to be so far in my life anyway, endless. Um, I mean, it does have an end, I guess, when there's no self, right? When there's no self, nothing to examine because you're perfectly unselfish and you're just completely full of love. What is there to examine? It's all the same outside and inside, bliss, right? Well, we're not there yet. So, uh, yes, hiss but don't bite and be very careful what you call what, right? Be very careful what you say, oh, that was a hiss, and this is a bite, and whatever else, right? Because we're apt to fool ourselves in that, yeah. Well, I guess he's, he's running a show. Go ahead. Thank you. So I'm here, I think, fourth time in the last 20 years, hmm. and uh, I felt this talk was for me. Okay, very good. However, it got together, or however, I got here. I have, you know, I, I, you know, I, I can spend a lot of time looking at it. But uh, first is the comment uh, that when you talked about those people crying, mm. uh, I think it's a, it's an experience of being gotten. Being gotten that if somebody gets you, and then you you can unwind, mm. like all mm. the energy you spend being something, trying to be something, then somebody gets you that you have a release. And I, I like it. And I experienced that today also. Okay, very good. I want to say that to you. And then... But you're not going to follow me out crying, I don't think. <laughs> no, That's another level. Yeah. That is, uh, but, but it's there. I just wanted you to know that it's there. 
And, and then the second thing you talked about killing the Batman and uh, the Batman inside. Um, I got a lot of answers today in your talk, and what I what, what was left for me was uh, the ignorance in mm. Batman that you talked about. Mm. And then you talked about what I felt you you didn't talk about the attachments the Batman had. I didn't. I don't remember, but that's what. I'm left with those two words. He's attached to his own pain. He's that was the idea. He's attached to his own yeah. pain and... Won't let it go. Things. Can't forgive. Yeah. And, and, and I feel... And I'll just speak for myself. I have a lot of that too in life. You know, there's, there's We're all Batman. And yes. And right. It manifests as feelings and emotions and all those things. So I want to hear what you have to say about it. That how do you... How do I... Or how does anybody save the Batman? Save means, what is save? Save Batman, what does it mean? Getting all of his ignorance and attachments. Oh, yeah. Well, that could be another whole lecture, right? Yeah. I mean, um, uh, I don't know. It's difficult so broadly to sum that up in a few minutes. I mean, I guess what Swami Vivekananda said in a word that to be religious means to be unselfish. So in general, good rule of thumb, if it is selfish, it's Batman. If it's unselfish, it's Superman. Now, again, just like the snake and the hiss and Batman's true motives, we have to stay vigilant and you have to try and really, is this really unselfish? Right? Am I just fooling myself here? You know, the mind likes it. The mind is like this little spoiled kid that, that tries to get away with stuff. And you've got to police it all the time. And so, uh, I mean, there's really no easy answer to your question. I would say that's the broadest, from the broadest level, I would say be unselfish, try and act out of love, but watch yourself because the mind is very clever and will try and hoodwink us, make us think that what we're doing is actually altruistic when in fact we're being egotistical, ignorant and entitled and resentful and all these other things, just right below the surface, right? But it fools us. We run out to go, you know, fight crime or, or take down the Capitol building or whatever else because we're right. You know, that's another thing to be careful about is strong opinions. You know you're right and the other side is wrong, right? Black and white. It's not black and white. Whatever situation we find ourselves in, there's another side to it. But, um, yeah, so self-examination, I think, if I, have, if I was going to take one soundbite message today, if you want to kill Batman, examine yourself. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you know, if somebody has to go, I understand not everybody has questions. You want to go, that's, you know, I won't be offended. All right. Thank you so much. I, was, I, I resonated with the whole talk, and honestly, I just wanted to say about saving Batman, if you're interested, not to plug Swami D, but he gave a talk on the, un, on the necessary ego, which I think it's on YouTube. But that was really helpful for me about, yeah, I want to kill Batman, but Batman always comes back. So it's like refining. And I guess Ramakrishna talked about the, the right ego versus the unright ego. But yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's a good one, a point you made. Um, the ripe ego is the ego that is somehow attached to God. So you say, I'm a servant of God, I'm a child of God, because we have that I sense in us, right? So we try and identify the ego with God, connect it with God somehow. I'm God's friend, servant, child, you know, and there's other attitudes as well. I mean, there's parents. I mean, people look at the baby Jesus or the baby Krishna, right? So there's all these attitudes towards God, but those are all egotistical, but that's the ripe ego, right? That is the ego that is going to lead us beyond ego, right? Okay, we did it. Good. All right. <laughs> Thank you.